Here are 10 tips to design better databases as a beginner in no code. This video is part of our no code architecture course. So if you find this interesting, definitely go to our website and check out our free course, which is an entirely ad free experience as well. So tip number one, you're going to hear lots of advice and lots of feedback all over the internet. And you want to make sure that the advice you're hearing is pertinent based on the tool you're using and the plan that you're currently on. Let me give you a couple of examples. So for Airtable workspaces, for example, we look at their pricing plans and you can see that you only get one workspace if you're on free. And even if you're on the paid team plan, you only get one workspace. And then if you go to business and enterprise, you suddenly get unlimited workspaces. So if you're on one of the upper tier pricing plans in Airtable, you can definitely use workspaces to help organize your bases, almost like you would with folders. But if you try to apply that same concept and you're on the team plan, you're going to be in for a rude awakening as suddenly you're going to get charged for multiple workspaces. Or let's talk about syncing. You're going to hear some people say, hey, you should only use one base for everything in your business. And a lot of that comes from the perspective of it's hard to sync data between different bases. Well, if you have access to two-way synchronization, it's much easier to be able to have data in different bases that's kept in sync. And again, that's a feature that's only available on business and enterprise scale. So it makes sense that if you don't really have access to two-way syncing, you'd want to self-contain more of that data in a single base. Or if you're using another tool like SmartSuite, that concept doesn't even really apply because you're not worried about syncing data. Instead, you could have multiple solutions, which are like bases, and those tables can be linked to one another, no syncing necessary. So as you hear all of this advice, it's really important to keep in mind which tool and which plan you're on as the best practices might vary. Sometimes when we're working with a new client, we walk into their environment for the first time and they have hundreds of bases as a small business. And I think to myself, what would cause you as a small business to need hundreds of different bases in order to store your company's data? I think there's a couple of different things that happen. One is that it's so easy to be able to duplicate a base. You just make a copy of it. So I think some companies say, oh, I've got this master database here and I want to duplicate that out every single client project that I have. I have one project. Now I've got a new client. I want to duplicate this and make a project for them. And I want to duplicate that base and make a project for the next client. Or if you're a marketer, maybe you have a marketing campaign and you create a new base for each marketing campaign. But I think the most successful implementations are looking at a base as an end-to-end -end business process or workflow, meaning that you'll probably have a few different bases for your organization. And one of these is going to be your CRM. It's going to contain all of your sales data. So you're going to have your leads and your opportunities, your accounts. You could have things like quotes or proposals proposals, and all of that data is part of one sales workflow. Then you might have another base for project management, and that's going to have information about projects and milestones and tasks. But overall, creating fewer bases and centering them around your workflows as opposed to each individual one-off project or campaign is going to really help keep your data clean. Another reason you don't want to keep duplicating those bases is what happens when you need to make a change. So that could mean you need to add a couple new fields or you want to update an automation and suddenly you're having to go into each one of those bases. Maybe you've created 50 different projects, 50 different bases, and now you have to update that in all of those places. But that's going to be immensely cumbersome and going to ensure that your business processes are going to break down at some point along the way. Our next tip is around tables. Tables should represent single types of objects. This could be a table for contacts, a table for organizations, a table for products, a table for opportunities. What shouldn't happen is that you create kind of this Frankenstein table that contains all of this information that you want. So for example, if you're tracking people, I've got myself, Dan Lehman, and I work at Automation Helpers, but now I have all this information about Automation Helpers, my company, that is part of this contact record. So I've got my name, but I've got the company, I've got the company's address, and all of this I'm trying to store in one table. Instead, it's important to think of a list of the attributes that you want to track, and then determine which of those tables it goes into. So a name would be the property of the contact table. A phone number is most likely a property of the contact table. The address of the business is going to be part of that organization or company table. A URL of the company's LinkedIn page is going to be that company table as well. Now I can understand it's valuable to know that information regardless of which of the tables you're on, if it's the contacts or the companies. And so our next tip is to reduce duplication of information by using lookups between tables. Let's show you a quick example. I'm on my contacts table here and I've got my companies stored in this accounts table. Back on my contacts table, we can see that I already have a link relationship to my account. So I've got Rose Fowler linked to Bear Paw Solutions. Now let's say when I'm looking up Rose's information, it would be helpful for me to know her company's website. So we can simply click on the account, add lookup fields, and we can toggle on the company website and press add one field. Now we've got information about that company website 
We can click the link if we need to, but that data will never get out of sync because that data actually lives on the account. So you don't have to feel like you need to duplicate data between those two different tables even if you want to show that information in two different places. Now, in our previous tip, we were talking about how you should have a table represent a single type of object. And this next tip is actually the opposite side of the spectrum. It's that we don't want to have two tables that are really similar in nature as two separate tables. Instead, we should combine them into a single table. Now, a non-business example here is if we had a table for cats and a table for dogs, and we had cat records and we had dog records, when in reality, we could probably have a table called pets and we could have a type as a differentiator between cat and dog. From a business standpoint, you might be thinking about leads and contacts. And in reality, you could probably combine the two into a single contacts table. As opposed to having two different tables, you could keep them together in a contacts table and have a type identifier for lead or for current customer. We explore this topic more in depth in another video, so feel free to check out the link if you're interested in that. The next tip is to really deeply understand the types of relationships between your different tables. So making sure you understand what one-to-many, many-to-one, many-to-many type relationships, and understand when do I need to use junction tables. Junction tables are going to be perfect for combining things like we have opportunities and products, and we need to have an opportunity lines to show that relationship between the two. Understanding these different types of relationships are going to be foundational to your database design. So check out the other videos in our course so you can explore this topic more in depth. Once you have a good understanding of database relationships, then I think it's important that you're always looking to model your data before you build your database. Now there are tools built into Airtable. If we click on our extensions, add an extension, and we can use this base schema here. And our base schema helps show us the different relationships that we have between tables and we can see the different dependencies as well of all these different fields. And I think this is a good way to help you visualize what's already there, especially if you've inherited a database and you need to get a better understanding of it. But when you're designing your database for the first time, this isn't used as much for modeling that data as it is for looking retrospectively at the different kinds of relationships. That's why I'd recommend using some kind of diagramming tool to help you represent those relationships before you're actually building it. So one that I use is called draw.io. This is entirely free. There's lots of different ones you can use. If you're already using Lucid for other purposes, you can use that too. But here it's really easy for us to be able to add a new table. We can add the different attributes of our table. If I want to show a relationship to this, I can simply click this arrow. I'm going to choose another table. And this already matches my two tables together. And I can add the different attributes of my table to this. This might feel like an extra step. And why is it really needed when it's so easy to be able to create and change your tables directly in a tool like Airtable? But I find this is so helpful to be able to communicate with clients. Or if you're building internally, communicating the design of this to your other stakeholders. Now, so much of what we talk about when it comes to database design is making sure that we don't duplicate information. And one way that we can help with duplicates is by using an extension like dedupe, which helps you find data that's already duplicated, and then you can merge or remove those additional records so that we get rid of any additional duplicate data that we have. However, I view this as a crutch. If you're only focused on duplicate data after the data has already been duplicated, then you have a problem. Instead, I think it's immensely important that you're designing your system to prevent duplicate information from being entered in the first place. So let me give you an example here. Let's say we're collecting form submissions from our website. And when we get those form submissions, we're going to create a new contact automatically in the background through an automation. It would be really easy just to have a step that says, when the form is submitted, let's go ahead and create a new contact record. But what we do for almost all of our automations is to bake in checks into the system so that we don't unnecessarily create a new contact record if there's one that already matches the same criteria. So for example, in this case, I'm performing two checks. First, I see if their email domain already exists from the email address associated with that contact form submission. And then I'm also checking to see if a contact exists that has that exact email address. Because then I could have follow-up steps to say, if there's not a matching account for this, we know there's also not a contact that matches this. Therefore, let's go ahead and create that account and we'll link that contact and we'll link the two of them together. Or if there is a matching account, but there's no contact, we can create the new contact record and associate it with that account. So that kind of design thinking, thinking ahead of time about what might actually cause those duplicate contacts then helps prevent that proactively. So it's very rare that we actually have duplicate contacts that show up in our database. Now, this next tip might sound super obvious, but we should always break down our fields into the smallest component possible. Now, I say this sounds obvious, but this CRM that I have here is actually a template that comes directly from Airtable. And in it, on their contacts, they just have a name field 
which represents both the first name and last name. The problem here is, let's say that we use this for our marketing automation. We actually sync this data that we have with MailChimp. If inside of MailChimp, we want to have an email and we reference the first name, we say, hi, first name, and we have the body of our email. How do we know what's actually the first name? We could make a guess, but oftentimes people have multiple names or they have a hyphenated first name. Storing all that information in one field isn't the way to go. Instead, you'd want to have one text field for the first name, one for the last name. And if it's important for you to be able to visualize that together in one field, you can do that too. We'd simply add a new field. We could call this full name. We'll use a formula. And then we can simply concatenate the first name followed by a space. And let's concatenate the last name. We'll create the field. And now we can still have that full name rows follower up here, but we can actually break that down because we've got that separate first name from the last name. Now, this is a little bit unique because different tools have different ways of handling this data. So for example, in SmartSuite, they have these compound fields. We've got one for full name, where we actually have the ability to store the first name and the last name, or we could have something like an address field where it stores all of the different pieces of that address in here as well. And so what that means is we have the ability to still have the structured data, but the UI supports having this kind of compound field, which pulls all of those attributes together. Now, the last tip is I'd highly recommend that you get to know and understand the record ID of a given record. Yes, it's very helpful to have a primary field and to use unique values for the primary field, but that information most of the time is for the UI to help us distinguish the different people at this organization should we have duplicate names. But there is a true, actually unique record identifier behind every single one of these records. If you want to expose it so you have visibility to it, it's really easy to do. We could add a new field. We'll call it record ID, search for formula, and then you can simply search for record ID, select it, close the parenthesis, and we'll create that field. And now you can see how each one of these records has that unique identifier. Also, if you expand one of these records and you go to look at the URL, you can see that there's this unique URL structure that includes that unique record ID at the end. And these record IDs you're going to use all over the place. Three places I can think of are if you're trying to pre-fill forms, you'll want to use record IDs for that. If you're doing automations and you're using any kind of record update, you'll need to use the record ID for that. And if you're doing any kind of integration work with Make or Zapier, you'll need to use record identifiers there as well. I hope these tips were helpful for you in your journey of database design. If you have any questions about your own database setup, don't hesitate to reach out to our team at automationhelpers.com where we're offering free 30-minute consultations.